show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Is the government in trouble? That's the question we'll be asking this morning on The Briefing. We'll be talking about Boris Johnson's surprising speech yesterday where he fluffed his words, the rebellion last night in Parliament, the channel crisis crossings that seem to be growing and growing, and indeed the energy price cap. All that and so much more coming up on The Briefing in five minutes time. Good morning, I'm Tamsin Roberts. Here are the news headlines at nine o'clock. At least 45 people, including 12 children, have died in a bus crash in western Bulgaria. Seven people who managed to escape are in hospital in a stable condition. The incident happened on a highway about 45 kilometres west of the capital, Sofia, in the early hours of this morning. It's thought the majority of passengers were tourists from North Macedonia. The Bulgarian investigative service says the cause of the crash is not yet known. MPs have narrowly voted in favour of cost-saving reforms to the government's social care policy. They won the vote by 26, with 87 Conservative MPs rebelling or abstaining. The changes mean only personal contributions will count towards an £86,000 cap. State benefits won't be included. Some backbench MPs say the changes will hit the poorest people hardest and could force some to sell their homes to cover the cost of care. Chief Executive of Cascadeur, Belinda Schwer, says the government government doesn't understand the care system. Even though the poor will be impacted on more directly, it will be better for more people. The real problem is that there hasn't been a proper debate by people who understand the system. Families whose um, uh, representatives step up and do informal care are actually saving the rest of us from having to pay more tax. And yet the charging system will not take account of how much care you get. The requiem mass of Sir David Amos, the Conservative MP who was killed during a constituency meeting, will be held at Westminster Cathedral this morning. The Archbishop of Westminster will lead the service alongside a representative from the Vatican who will deliver a special message from Pope Francis. The service follows the private funeral held in Southend yesterday. Boris Johnson and Sir Keir Starmer will be among senior politicians attending to pay their respects to the father of five. It's emerged that the man accused of killing five people at a parade in Wisconsin was out on bail on domestic abuse charges. Daryl Brooks faces five counts of first-degree homicide after police say he deliberately drove his car into the Christmas parade on Sunday. 48 people were injured, including six children who are in a critical condition. The Milwaukee District Attorney has said Brooks had been out on inappropriately low bail. A new study shows that regularly performing household chores leads to better memory and attention span in older adults. 
published in the British Medical Journal, researchers say that elderly people who participate in a combination of lighthouse work and chores appear to have higher cognitive function than those who don't. Participants in the study who carry out more heavy housework had higher attention span scores and perform better on memory tests. John Agleton, Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience, told GB News that exercise enhances connections in the brain. First of all, it helps your blood supply, and that's great news for your brain. There's also evidence that certain hormones that are induced by exercise and activity actually increase plasticity in your brain. And of course, that's very beneficial for learning and memory. The NHS could start to prescribe people living with mild depression exercise or therapy over medication. That's according to new draft guidance from the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. It recommends group sessions in things like meditation, exercise, behavioural therapy or individual counselling sessions, which should be offered as a first treatment rather than antidepressants. NICE says it's the first guideline in 12 years to identify, treat and manage depression in adults. Black Friday may not be the best time of year to land a good deal. Consumer group Witch investigated six major retailers and found around 92% of products, including washing machines, soundbars and TVs, were the same price or cheaper in the six months before Black Friday. And in the six months after, almost all, that's 98% of items, were cheaper or the same price. The Brit Awards are going gender neutral with the male and female categories being scrapped. Instead, prizes will be given to Artist of the Year and International Artist of the Year. Sam Smith, who won the Critics' Choice Prize in 2014 and identifies as gender neutral, was among those pushing for the move. The awards take place at the O2 Arena in London in February. Well, that's all for now. I'll be back with the headlines in half an hour. Now, though, it's back to The Briefing and Tom Harwood. Good morning, it's nine o'clock and you're watching The Briefing with Tom Harwood. Now, the government pushed through a change to their social care plans by 272 votes to 246 last night, a much tighter margin than is comfortable for a government with a large majority. 18 Tory rebels directly voted against the government, while a further 68 did not turn up at all. The government amendment being voted on was designed to stop council support payments being counted towards the new £86,000 cap on lifetime care costs. People with less valuable assets can apply for council help to pay for their care costs, but the changes mean they'll eventually have to pay up to £86,000 out of their own pockets. Now, worryingly for the Prime Minister, the government majority was down from a notional 77 to just 25. But that's not the only worry that the Prime Minister had yesterday. The Prime Minister gave an interesting speech to the Confederation of British Industry Conference yesterday. And it's fair to, see that it's fair to say that it was not his finest moment of oratory. He repeatedly lost his place, asked the audience to forgive him more than a handful of times, pretended to be a car at one point, and managed to make many miss the point of a very sound reference to the unexpected genius of Peppa Pig. It all led to one, reporting asking, one reporter asking the Prime Minister, is everything OK? Motoring correspondent, EVs may not burble like sucking doves and they may not have that rum, rum, rah, rah that you love. Uh, safer streets uh, with great local schools, uh, with fantastic uh, broadband. Uh, uh, forgive me, forgive me. And Tony, yesterday I went, uh, as, as we all must, uh, 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 to, to Peppa Pig World. I don't know if you've been to Peppa Pig World. Who's been to Peppa Pig World? Who's been to Peppa Pig World? <laughs> Not enough. I was, well, it's, it's fact, I was a bit hazy what I would find at Peppa Pig World, uh, but I loved it. And Peppa Pig World is, is very much my kind of place. Uh, but the real lesson for me going to Peppa Pig World, and I'm surprised you haven't been there, uh, was about the power of UK creativity. Uh, who would have believed uh, Tony, that a pig that looks like a hairdryer, uh, or, or possibly a, well, a sort of Picasso-like hairdryer, uh, a pig that was rejected by the BBC, uh, would now be exported to 180 countries with theme parks both in, uh, in America and in China as well as in, as well as in the New Forest. 
I mean, I laughed a couple of times during that speech, but I'm not sure it was the most sound display in front of industry leaders. Well, let's dissect some of the problems that the Prime Minister is facing now with John Rental, the chief political commentator for The Independent. Um, John, was this speech the disaster that it's being portrayed as? Well, I can't say I watched it all uh, live, Tom, but uh, uh, no, it wasn't a disaster. I mean, in a sense, it was classic uh, Boris Johnson because it was drawing attention to himself. Uh, I mean, we're spent we're spending the whole time this morning talking about the Prime Minister's disastrous speech or dissecting how disastrous it was, whether it was disastrous. Uh, and we're not talking about Keir Starmer's rival speech to the CBI, uh, which was much more politically significant in the sense that it was uh, well received. I mean, the CBI thought that the Prime Minister's speech was rubbish and patronising. Uh, and uh, the president of the CBI uh, said incredibly nice things about Keir Starmer's speech. It was music to his ears. It was just the sort of thing that uh, he wanted to hear, presenting Labour as the party of business. Um, and yet here we are talking about Peppa Pig. Now, we hear a lot about the words dead cat, this strategy that so, that uh, supposedly Sir Linton Crosby once came up with in, in 20. <laughs> well, I don't think he lost his way on purpose, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So to explain to the audience, a dead cat is when, uh, is when uh, I don't know, a, a political leader thinks that things are not going well for them and so want a distraction. But no, that that's not your contention here. Uh, no, no. He genuinely had lost his, uh, lost his way in, in that speech. And there was a very funny... Uh, a photo of uh, Rishi Sunak at a computer doing the rounds on social media last night with the caption, uh, removing the page numbers from uh, Boris Johnson's CBI speech. Uh, there does seem to be a bit of, uh, a bit of uh, turmoil going on behind the scenes because there was also that briefing from Downing Street, uh, not number 10 Downing Street, just Downing Street, to the BBC last night, uh, saying that the, uh, the, the, the situation in the building was, uh, was chaotic. So there's clearly something going on uh, behind the scenes. Uh, but, the, uh, but the Prime Minister did not lose his way in that speech deliberately. He, you could see he's, he's, he's fumbling. Um, he's, he's fumbling to try and find the, the page he's supposed to be on and, and launching into what looks like an ad lib about Peppa Pig, but is actually a section from, a, from another speech that he was about to give later uh, to the Margaret Thatcher uh, conference on on trade organised by the Centre for Policy Studies, which is a, a, a think tank. Interestingly, this is a man who has given, I don't know how many after dinner speeches in his life. He is a seasoned performer when it comes to this stuff. Is, is everything all right in number 10? Is everything all right in Downing Street? Is, is perhaps all of the problems over the dip in the polls, over the rebellion last night on social care, over the sort of unease that there is now in the Parliamentary Conservative Party, is that getting to him perhaps? Possibly. I mean, people, uh, people close to him say that uh, he, he has a cold and therefore um, was, and, and you know, he has, he has had quite a hectic schedule. Uh, including those two uh, speeches that uh, quite important speeches he was uh, delivering yesterday. I mean, and one of them was 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 up north, so there's quite a lot of travel involved. Um, but no, I, I think we may be reading too much into uh, Boris Johnson uh, just losing his page in a in in the middle of a, a speech which he hadn't uh, prepared uh, very well for. Uh, but that's Boris Johnson through and through. He always thinks he can busk it. Um, he always thinks that actually. Losing his way in the middle of a speech is, is, is it, people are going to think that's hilariously funny uh, because that's his shtick. You know, he always used to turn up to speeches pretending he didn't know where he was and who he was speaking to, uh, and 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 pretending he hadn't got any notes, and then and then he would usually deliver quite a quite a witty after dinner speech. But the CBI expected to be taken a bit more seriously than that. Of course, the CBI is an organisation that Boris Johnson hasn't always had the best of relationships with. It was the mortal enemy of the Vote Leave campaign. Uh, and of course, Boris Johnson famously uh, was reported to have said a few years ago, uh, F word business, something that Keir Starmer referenced in his speech, as he said. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is part of, uh, of, of, of politics that has been going on for some time, since, since Tony Blair's time, actually, uh, the Labour Party. Uh, trying to woo uh, the CBI, trying to get in with big business, um, most of which was uh, was was pro-remain, uh, very pro-staying in the in the EU, 
uh, whereas Boris Johnson obviously is uh, is much more aligned with small businesses, self-employed people who tended to be much more Eurosceptical. So yeah, there's a lot of that going on, and so in a, in a sense, I suppose you could say it's not surprising that the CBI uh, was so friendly towards Keir Starmer. But I mean, we have had the five-year uh, interregnum of, uh, of of Jeremy Corbyn uh, when uh, when the CBI was deeply suspicious of the Labour Party, and so we're sort of back to pre-Corbyn politics as far as the Labour Party is concerned. Now, just finally, a, a small question on last night's rebellion. Um, a significant rebellion, many Tory MPs sitting on their hands, quite a few uh, directly voting against the government as well. Does that matter? Is this a government losing its grip? Well, it doesn't help, I mean, it, and it does give the appearance of a government that's losing its grip. But uh, I think William Hague has a nice line, uh, the former Tory leader, in his column in The Times today about how uh, the government, uh, the government isn't about to melt down, but is giving quite a good impression uh, of doing so. Uh, I don't think this rebellion does matter, to be honest. Um, I mean, it was it was a significant rebellion. It's Tory MPs expressing unhappiness, but it's not actually going to change the social care plans. I think they will go, they will now go to the House of Lords. They may be an attempt to, to tweak them there, but it'll come back to the Commons, and uh, I think uh, I think the government will will sort it out. I mean. It's partly about trying to explain uh, what the plans are better to, to Tory MPs, many of whom uh, don't understand it. And I don't blame them because it's incredibly complicated. No, absolutely. Well, I mean, this is, a, this is potentially an issue that is not going to do as much damage as the, as the self-inflicted row over standards. But still, it, 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 it's another straw on the camel's back. I wonder how long this will drag on for. But John Rental, for now, thank you very much for joining us this morning on The Briefing to discuss those two interesting issues. Now, moving on, there are, of course, headlines this morning of further crisis in the energy industry. Around a dozen energy companies have gone bust. And last night, Bulb, which is one of the largest, I think the seventh largest energy supplier in the UK, went into administration. What on earth is, calling, is causing this crisis? Well, one of the answers is the energy price cap. Brought in under David Cameron, it limits the amount that energy companies can charge for their energy. However, at a time that wholesale prices are soaring, it means that energy companies, instead of being uh, clipped of their profits, are instead charging people not enough for the energy and going out of business. Is this an entirely counterproductive measure? Well, let's discuss this now with John McDonald, Head of Strategy at the Adam Smith Institute, a leading political think tank. So, John, um, this price cap, it was firstly proposed by Ed Miliband as a price freeze, uh, at which point David Cameron opposed it, calling it some sort of Marxist scheme, and then he introduced it. Um, <laughs> Is, is it now coming back to bite the Tories that they went ahead with it? Well, yes. What we're seeing at the moment uh, are the consequences of a distorted and non-competitive market, which is in large part due to the energy price cap. As should be common knowledge, reducing competition, uh, or sorry, reducing, uh, reducing competition leads to higher prices. At the moment, customers are trapped in a market where wholesale energy prices are high, but there are no competitive pressures on providers to offer anything much below the price cap. Uh, and usually the best way for customers to protect themselves against rising energy prices is to shop around for the best tariff. But having a cap means customers often believe there is no point in doing so. And this then results uh, in a lack of incentive for energy companies to compete on offering better prices if they feel that their customers uh, are much less likely to switch to other providers anyway. And also, 23 companies have now folded. 23 energy companies have folded in short order. Um, is this just the brutal reality that really energy companies need to charge more and they're not being allowed to? Yeah, I mean, I suppose we're, we're sort of living with the, the consequences of bad policy. If the government is going to distort the market with, with price caps, it, it can't expect it to function well during a crisis. And as a result, the taxpayer is going to end up footing the bill for, for collapsed companies like Bulb as they go into special administration, uh, and they're propped up with, with public funds. So when we're looking at the viability of the price cap continuing, is it now entering the so-called Overton window, the realm of political possibility, that the price cap will, after around five years, be scrapped? 
I mean, I would hope so. Uh, I, I think somewhat counterintuitively, you know, uh, if there's a big price differential between standard variable uh, tariffs and, and cheaper tariffs uh, are there, it means that you have a, a healthy market. So you actually want a market in which some people uh, are perhaps being charged perhaps too much for their energy and other people are getting very good deals on their energy. Not the situation now where everyone is paying quite a lot for their energy. I see. So really, we need a, a greater sort of disparity in the market. And, and currently, the government is gunging all of that up. Um, I wonder to what extent people understand that process, because it's quite a complicated thing to explain. People would hear the words energy price cap and think, great, that means cheaper energy, <laughs> but, but not quite so. Yes, no, that's, that's, that's kind of the difficulty with this is that it's it, it's it's quite hard to explain to people, and there's there's actually a lot of evidence that, that price caps reduce customer engagement, which then uh, allows companies to be much less competitive. I mean, I think evidence there's some evidence from Australia in 2012, Queensland's politics forced uh, the price cap to be lower, which again means that uh, the companies uh, have even less pressure to be competitive. Uh, and at that point, just over 45 percent of customers were on a standing offer, 40 percent were on a medium level discount. And just uh, uh, four years later, uh, the number ac accessing discounts had halved uh, with the number of people on the sort of very close to the price cap tariff uh, uh, sticking with it. And so what are the free market solutions here, if not a price cap? Uh, are there any actual uh, proactive things that could be done, maybe not in the short term, but in the medium to long term to help energy costs go down? I mean, we're seeing that much of the uh, cheap Dirty energy is being phased out, and maybe for good reason. What are the free market ways of lowering energy prices? Well, you're quite right to point out in the immediate term, it's quite difficult to say what should be done. But in the longer term, the aim must be to restore a more price efficient uh, and competitive market. Uh, and I think there are a number of alternative measures uh, that could cut costs for, for vulnerable customers, because that's really you know, where, where people's concerns are at the moment, uh, without sort of leading to, uh, to, to reduced customer engagement and stifling innovation. So this could include uh, opt-out collective switches uh, and allowing competitors to target uh, disengaged customers much more directly. Well, John McDonald, thank you very much for joining uh, us here on The Briefing this morning. I think it's an issue that doesn't get discussed enough, the particulars of how government intervention can actually make things worse, not necessarily better. Well, that was the energy price cap. Now, Lord Frost made the most important intervention we've seen from any cabinet minister in a long time last night. A warning shot fired at the course this government is taking. Some might say fired at the Prime Minister. Speaking at the influential Centre for Policy Studies conference on trade yesterday, the Brexit Minister spoke a truth we've not heard so explicitly from this government in a long time. In his closing remarks, Lord Frost said, The formula for success as a country is well known. Low taxes. I agree with the Chancellor, as he said in his budget speech, our goal must be to reduce taxes, light touch and proportionate regulation, whatever our policy objectives. He went on to say, we can't carry on as we were before. And if after Brexit, all we do is import the European social model, we will not succeed. And this is the fundamental truth of the matter. Brexit doesn't in and of itself make us richer. What it does is give us control, give us the tools and the levers to deliver a freer and richer society. If we don't use those tools to change our country, to reduce regulation, we'll have the right to ask, what was the point? If we leave the European Union only to reimpose its failing economic model of high taxes, high regulation, anti-innovation policies and low stagnant growth, there's an argument that we might not have left at all. What would have been the point? This was the argument against some of the original proposed Brexit deals, those that trapped us within the EU's regulatory orbit. They would not have allowed us to seize the opportunities of Brexit, and that's why those proposed deals were comprehensively rejected. Instead, a deal that allowed regulatory divergence was reached. Now we've reclaimed that independence, we must use it. Yes, this government seems to be the most peculiar bland, blend of the worst as aspects of big state high tax toyism, and Lord Frost appears to know it. That's why he went on to say this. To make the best decisions, we need the fullest and freest possible debate. I believe that free debate is a good thing. 
It forces everyone to test their arguments, and I strongly believe it means the best ideas win. Clearly, he feels that the cabinet is too, too restrained at the moment. He wants to speak his mind. And for the sake of the country, he must, along with everyone else who's concerned with the direction of this high taxing, big state, big Toryism government. Well, now a yet another problem for this government. Home Secretary Priti Patel is under immense pressure from Downing Street and Parliament over efforts to stop illegal channel crossings. The number of people making those perilous crossings has risen tenfold in just two years. Now, Shadow Home Secretary Nick Thomas-Simmons claims that his counterpart is failing and that her incompetence on the issue is dangerous. Priti Patel's already seen her wings clipped as well, with Cabinet Office Minister Stephen Barclay being tasked with resolving the crisis instead of the Home Secretary. His new task force meets this week, amid fraught negotiations with France, struggling to reach an agreement over Channel patrols. Well, joining us to discuss this now is Khaled Mahmood, the Labour MP from Birmingham Perry Bar and former Shadow Defence Secretary. Khaled, welcome to the programme. Uh, the government seems to be in trouble over this and the Labour Party seems to be talking about it. Is this a bit of a change in direction from the Labour Party, sort of raising this as an issue? Well, no, I, I think the situation is getting bad from bad to worse. Uh, and what the uh, Home Secretary needs to do is to grab, uh, grab hold of it. She hasn't done so. The number of people uh, crossing the, the, the channel is increasing hugely and putting their lives at risk, but also uh, our, our Navy also is, is going to have to try and save them. It's one of the busiest lanes there that we have uh, in terms of travel uh, across that and trade that's been done across, uh, across the channel. Uh, and absolutely no control at all by the, by, the, by the Home Secretary. The numbers are increasing and, and people's lives have been put at risk. Absolutely. It seems like a terrible situation for everyone involved, not least the migrants who are making those perilous journeys. And of course, those numbers are staggering. It's, it's, it's amazing this hasn't been a bigger story for quite a while, a tenfold increase in just two years. The government clearly under a lot of pressure there. My question, though, Khaled, is do people believe that the Labour Party would be any better on the issue? What the Labour Party would look at uh, is first of all the way that they, people are coming through France and through Europe. Uh, and it's important to say that once people get to France, it's very difficult to police that. We've got a huge uh, border that we're trying to, try, trying to stop people coming through. Uh, and it's absolutely phenomenal. One of the key things that we would look at, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is looking at working with the international agencies, aid agencies, to see how we can stop people getting into Europe, what, what their needs are, how we can assess them, how we can support them on the shores before they get into Europe. Once those people are coming through Europe, then the whole thing falls apart. Uh, and one of the first questions I asked the Home Secretary is, how do we get safe routes sorted out? And if those safe routes are sorted out, will she allow those people to stay? And then she said yes. So she has no, at one hand, she's trying to pull, put a bill forward to turn people around uh, across in the channel. On the other hand, she's saying that she would allow people through once the uh, agencies put them onto a safe route. So how is she going to deal with that when you cut aid? How are you going to assess those people uh, at the point where they're, they're leaving their shores to come into Europe and to deal with it? That's what the problem is. She hasn't took control of that. And it's too late when they come to France to try and do anything because whichever part of the coastline they go to, they can get into a dinghy and get across, and that's what the problem is, putting their lives at risk. Now, we're giving the French tens of millions of pounds to try and sort out this issue. Tens of millions of pounds every six months, it seems to be. Um, do you think the French are doing enough? Well, I don't know, and it doesn't look like the fact that they are doing enough, because the more people are being put at risk uh, by, by being travelled by these uh, unscrupulous uh, people uh, who are putting these people in and making huge amounts of money out of it. Uh, and that's not the thing I want. I think where people want to apply for asylum, want to come through, they should be able to have a processing centre to deal with that in France, if need be. Has the Home Secretary has said that we can do that at the, at the point of origin where they're trying to come out? So I think that's what the problem is. Once you allow people to unabatedly to, to get to a particular point, it's very difficult then to stop them. You have a huge coastline. How do you deal with that? Uh, and it's a small number of people, so there aren't going to be huge numbers of people. You're not going to be able to do that. So what we need to do is look at their human rights uh, and how we can deal with that. 
but turning people back in the middle of the channel uh, isn't constructive either. What happens uh, if somebody uh, actually is lives lost? Who's accountable for that? Uh, and the idea that she's coming up using a third country uh, to uh, vet people and get them through. Again, what happens to those people that are not approved? How does that country deal with that? And how is she going to get agreement on that? It's, it's all about trying to have soundbats every single time she comes to the common and the bills that she's trying to get passed, but nothing concrete. Well, Khaled Mahmood, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. I'd love to discuss this further. Thank you very much for joining us this morning on The Briefing, because, of course, this is such an important issue, a tenfold increase in just two years. Well, that's it for the programme and indeed that interview as well. So coming up, it's to the point with Patrick Christie's and Mercy Maroki. But first, here's a look at the weather. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello, a very good morning to you. A few frost and fog patches around first thing, but it's replaced by sunny spells this afternoon. Although there will be a lot of cloud around, more cloud compared to recent days. That cloud is coming in around the edge of this area of high pressure into mainly northern and increasingly eastern parts of the UK. It's closest to the area of high pressure where we're seeing those frost and fog patches first thing. Wales, parts of western England, for example. Any fog.